Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Stay in touch and let us know what you like. Today we are going to look at Integrated Flight Test 3. In this mission, the SpaceX Starship launched from Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas. It climbed rapidly with all 33 engines running perfectly, climbing to its staging altitude and velocity. At that point, the SpaceX Starship hot-staged from the booster, just like the old Soviet N1, and climbed on towards space and a near-orbital trajectory. For this mission, SpaceX did not want to actually put the Starship into orbit, as that would take an active retro-orbital burn to bring it back down. If something went wrong, no one wanted a 167-foot-tall, 30-foot-wide, 120-ton steel Starship wandering around in orbit. After staging, the booster was lost, which is where I have a contention with the SpaceX haters. Every booster from every rocket ever launched, except for the SpaceX Falcon 9 and a few Rocket Lab Electron boosters, were destroyed. It is ridiculous to say that SpaceX has failed unless it recovers the booster. In fact, it would be more immediately profitable if SpaceX gave up on recovery for now and just stripped the boosters down for single use. They could do the same thing for Starship, making one from aluminum and carbon fiber components to create permanent orbital laboratories and lunar landing systems. In fact, I think they should probably consider doing this. The reality that Starship made it to orbital altitudes and velocities is a total victory with this perspective. But SpaceX isn't trying to do what everyone has already done. It's trying to do what no one has ever done. And that's not throw away any part of your ship. Total reusability. Not even the space shuttle, American or Soviet, accomplished this. The U.S. system recovered the boosters for refurbishing, but threw away this massive aluminum propellant tank. The Soviets threw away both the boosters and the hydrogen tank. But the American and Soviet shuttles survived re-entry, while the SpaceX Starship did not. Let's look at why this might be the case. One benefit to the Space Shuttle is these massive wings. They create a double delta re-entry shape. Other re-entry vehicles are shaped specifically so that they will automatically maintain the proper attitude on re-entry. These shapes and the Space Shuttle turned out to be stable even at hypersonic velocities. The Starship, on the other hand, is a rounded cylinder, and except for these smaller flaps, is just as aerodynamic at any orientation. In fact, this ship will have a strong tendency to be base-heavy, coming in like a large dart. There were times when, during the Starship's re-entry, it appeared that this is what was indeed happening. The heavy engines at the base of the Starship we're pulling it into a more vertical orientation. And these RCS thrusters, which might work great during orbital orientation changes, were far too weak to move the ship against this stream of hypersonic air. There is also the fact that even if the ship came down broadside, as it appears to be doing here, there is not much difference between this orientation and this one. If the ship comes in on its side, that would expose the unshielded steel to plasma temperatures of about 1,650 Celsius. This is enough to melt steel, and it will weaken at much lower temperatures, as well as starting to oxidize, corrode, and burn when combined with the air. So how can SpaceX correct this problem? It might be necessary to add a flap down here, like we see on the European Intermediate Experimental Vehicle, and here on the U.S. Space Shuttle and the Soviet Buran. By adding a heat-tiled protected flap down here, SpaceX might be better able to orient the ship through aerodynamic drag. The other thing to do is beef up the reaction control system. This is an American advanced fighter jet. It does things that would be aerodynamically impossible without thrust vectoring. Thrust vectoring is used on the Starship system, but it's very limited. If you want to control a massive ship falling at hypersonic speeds through thin atmosphere, 
you can't depend on aerial surfaces completely. The problem is that while hypersonic flight is a little harder than supersonic flight, the effect on aerial surfaces of subsonic flight can be the exact opposite of the effect of supersonic flight on those same surfaces. That is why bombers in a powered dive during World War II would sometimes tear themselves apart. Back then, pilots thought that there was a supersonic barrier that no one could break through. But the truth is, staying in the transition zone is what put them in danger, as they were going just fast enough to be in this dangerous transonic zone. At this transition point, forces in an aero surface can shift rapidly from one direction to the other, wrenching and twisting a ship. That is why the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 tore itself apart when the co-pilot accidentally released the feather device early. That means the Starship will need more powerful RCS thrusters. If you watched this lesson, you know all about these. Here are the thrusters on the Space Shuttle, Apollo Capsule, and Orion Capsule. Compare the relative size of these to what we see here on the Starship, and understand that all these other RCS thrusters are hypergolic, with high thrust and an efficiency of over 300 seconds of specific impulse. The Starship uses hot gas thrusters by venting from the pressurized methane tank, which has a specific impulse of only about half the hypergolic ones. And here you see a Dragon capsule, ready for launch. Here are the openings for the Draco RCS thrusters, which are, as I said, hypergolic. If we were to strip away the aero shell, we would see other components inside, like hoses and wires and windows, but we also see these large cavities. These are for the much larger Super Draco engines that we see in operation here. These carry the Dragon capsule away from the rocket in case of a launch failure. And in an emergency, they might be used to bring down a Dragon capsule if the parachutes failed. SpaceX had actually hoped to have powered landings for the Dragon capsule, but NASA didn't like this idea. A few of these Super Draco engines placed around the Starship for RCS control only during re-entry might have enough power to keep the ship in its proper orientation until it goes subsonic and can fall like we've seen before. There has also been criticism about the failure of heat tiles to stay attached. Let's not forget that this happened with the shuttle also. And not once did it cause a loss of vehicle accident. In fact, on one flight, the tile over part of the undersurface of a wing fell off. But happily, the metal under this tile was not aluminum like most of the wing. It happened to be a steel base for another component which is a good indication that if a few heat tiles are lost on the steel starship, it would probably still survive. There are materials much stronger than steel or titanium that could be considered for use. One of these is an alloy of chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel recently developed that was recognized to have outstanding properties. We have long known that combinations of chromium and nickel can create what are called high-entropy alloys. But computer modeling and AI has allowed us to imagine complex alloys that we couldn't have thought of before. These are very resistant to entropy. Entropy is what scientists call the universe's tendency toward randomness and disorder. It is why hot gases expand, rocks roll downhill, and electricity flows from higher to lower voltage. It also explains why heat, radiated through the stagnation layer of a gas that forms at the surface of a re-entry vehicle, causes the atoms in the material on the other side to vibrate more as they absorb these photons. We call this vibration heat, and different metals and alloys can withstand different intensities of heat, before they break loose and start melting, breaking off or burning. Steel can withstand about 1,400 Celsius before failing, while chromium nickel alloys, like those used on the amazing X-15, can withstand even more. Here you see the corrosion difference between steel and inconel under extreme conditions. Remember, inconel is an alloy of nickel and chromium. And here you can see inconel compared to other refractory metals under increasing temperature differences. Cold temperatures can also make metals brittle and prone to fracture and failure. This specific alloy, when cooled to cryogenic temperatures, can withstand 500 million pascals of force. 
while steel could only withstand about 100, meaning this alloy might be a really good cryogenic tank material choice. The other options to heat tiles are active cooling systems, like the transpiration method once considered by SpaceX, and the active cooling system used by Stoke Aerospace. I still think it would be interesting to put sea-level raptors around the perimeter of Starship space and have a hemispherical double-hulled shell here. You could pump cryogenic methane into the space between the shells. This would allow the transition from liquid to gas to absorb the heat, just like Stoke space. Though I still think you should run this heated gas through a combustion chamber. Stoke space plans to just vent the cryogenic hydrogen it uses around the ship on re-entry. In the military, we used to call this method a fuel-air explosive. But I'm sure they know what they're doing. Well, I hope you've learned a little from today's discussion, and remember to support our work on Patreon, so we can keep bringing you great lessons. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra. Hello, fellow space scholars. I wanted to thank you for being here. This channel started four years ago for many reasons. One of them is that I love to teach and have always wanted to learn how to create video lessons. Another was my frustration at the lack of facts in space news. I wanted to make sure that those truly interested in space science had somewhere to go to learn about the equations that make rockets possible, to give you the tools to make your own evaluations of different launch systems. But as important as understanding the equations are, they limit my channel to those with a serious interest in understanding space science. As many of you know, the YouTube algorithm promotes broad topics that are easy to understand. Our space science lessons, however, require a more detailed understanding, and I don't want to dumb the lessons down. But that makes the target audience a lot smaller. To take this channel to the next level, will require that I invest more time and resources, and that will require your help. Therefore, I really need your support via Patreon or YouTube membership. Just a little bit every month can make a huge difference, and would be greatly appreciated. I thank you so much, dear friends of Rocket Technology, for your continued support, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you, and stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra.